Well, hello there and uh, welcome again. Glad you've joined us here on the Melbourne Catholic uh, website and you're about to meet a fascinating person, Mark Hederman, a Benedictine monk, has joined us all the way from beautiful Ireland. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Shane. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, here in Australia for three weeks already and still a couple of weeks to go. Two weeks to go. Are you enjoying it? And immensely. Immensely. Every day has been most beautiful. And today was the only day I was reminded of Ireland. It was raining. Has been a bit of rain That's as we record. Mm -hmm. uh, I might mention that you are giving a series of lectures as, if you like, a tribute to the 200th anniversary of the founding of the Morris Brothers. Yes, exactly. Who've been well? It's being in Australia, I think, for that. I see. Time, yes. Know? So I'm here, and I'm giving the lectures in various locations and various workshops as well. So I'm having a wonderful time during those lec uh, lectures and workshops, visiting Brisbane and Sydney, Melbourne, of course, and then Adelaide and Perth, and then returning to Ireland. Well, I want to explore, if I may, your life. It's really interesting. Mm. Uh, your time at Glenstall Abbey, which has been a big part of your life, yeah. And then maybe a couple of your books as well. Um, okay. We've only got about 10 to 15 minutes, so I could do so much more. But your life, uh, mm. you, you went to boarding school at the age of nine mm. and actually to Glenstall Abbey at the age of 12. Tell us about your upbringing. So, well, my mother was American and uh, she came to Ireland to study in Trinity College, Dublin. She went to a farm in Limerick for a weekend on a visit. My father was the youngest boy on that farm. He fell in love with her when she was getting out of the car. We <laughs> kept on asking him, was it her ankle, what was it? And he <laughs> said no. Uh, he plucked up courage because he knew she was only there for a weekend and he said, I want to marry you. Wow. And she said, well, I know absolutely nothing about you. And he said, well, you know as much about me now as you're ever going to know, so you better make up your mind. <laughs> and that's why I was born in Limerick rather than in Boston where she came from. But she didn't approve of any of the education that she saw around her in Ireland at the time. So. We didn't go to school until we wanted to go to school. I had to ask, could I go to school? And then she inspected all the different schools and decided that the Benedictine school, which was only 40 miles from where we lived, yes. was the place, and that's where I went to school, and I have been there ever since. So you boarded for three years at Bray? Yes. From the age of nine? Yes. What was education like in those years? What's your best memory of it? Because I know you have some strong opinions on education per yeah. se. Well, I was nine when I went to school, so I, I couldn't get over the fact that all the others were so childish. <laughs> I mean, they were all brought up as children. We mm. were adults, so it, it took a bit of time to for them to be brought under control. <laughs> so anyway, I had a great time. And, and so I, mean, I enjoyed it. Very, of course, it's all to do with whether you like sport or not. Yes. Really, and... And, and they were very liberal schools. Uh, that she had chosen ones that weren't, because in those years, um, education was pretty violent and oppressive in yes. Ireland, but not in the ones I went to. And they were always very anxious to promote the talents and the development of the city. So I was given every opportunity. Sure. And when I joined the monastery then, I was sent all over the world. To, I was in Paris in 1968 to study theology during the student revolution that occurred there at that time. Fascinating. Yeah, and then I came back to the monastery and I taught for 25 years and then I was headmaster of the school there. And then in 2008, uh, it was a big surprise to me, I was elected abbot of Glanstall. Now that had its complications, did it not? It had a complication because I was a brother. I uh, had a monk and a brother for 50 years. Yes. But when I was uh, elected abbot, you couldn't ratify that election in Rome unless I agreed to become ordained a priest. I see. So, well, I felt if the Holy Spirit wanted me to become a priest, it didn't matter at all to me. So within one month, Rome can fast track these things when it's necessary. That is what you'd call a serious fast track. It was very serious and very fast. <laughs> and uh, so uh, a month later, I was ordained, and then I was uh, abbot of Lenstor, which is just finished now because it's eight years the period. Yes, is, and I was abbot for eight years. Let me explore back to when you started at Lenstor mm. at the age of twelve. You were a student. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Were you there via your parents' wishes or was there a calling and a closeness to God at that stage or was it more just, I'm just your normal everyday secondary school student? Well, you see, you don't know what other people are like. I thought everybody taught the same way as I do. I discovered much later that uh, people <laughs> don't think at all. You know, I mean, I know people who actually enjoy uh, a month lying on a beach and just uh, swimming and having a gin and tonic and going to bed. <laughs> I couldn't lie on a beach. I, 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 I think really what it boils down to is if you are actually philosophically minded, which I am, it's a disease. Mm -hmm. And there, if you have it, there's nothing you can do about it. You spend all your time trying to work out what is happening in this planet on which I was thrown without my permission. Mm -hmm. And that is trying to discover. So I was always like that. I always believed in God. I had a relationship with God. I, I mean, since I was nine, I remember it, which could have gone back further than that. So I've always had a connection with God. Now, I, I always thought that the way he was running the universe wasn't quite as successful as it might be. <laughs> so there was a kind of a part of it where you wanted to be where the action is yes. and be in the position to help them a bit, you know, because it was not going as well as it could have gone. So all of that was my... Uh, being with the Benedictines was just a very, very pleasant and very appropriate place in which to conduct that relationship. So that's the way I saw it. So at the age of 19, you decided you were going to become a Benedictine monk? Yes. And again, was that a calling? Was that just a natural progression? Well, in those days, the Benedictines, uh, they, that school was there to actually fill up the monastery with monks. So yeah. the boys who were quiet and well-behaved were approached by the monks and told that they thought you would be very good. Suitable. Now, there are other boys who were a bit more obstreperous, and they were <laughs> sent to be missioners, you see. <laughs> so there was another place in Navan, the Columban Fathers, and three of my class went there. Now, there are other boys who weren't asked to go anywhere. They were just let out into the jungle and... Just move on with their exactly, lives. yes. <laughs> but for uh, me, anyway, it, it seemed quite a natural way. Now, I went to university first, mm -hmm. and I did philosophy there. But then I, uh, I felt this was as good a place as any to conduct my relationship with God, which is all that interested me, really. And it wasn't a kind of lovey-dovey relationship. It was genuinely because I wanted to have a big say in how things were going in the creation, you see. So I felt if I was uh, near headquarters, as it were, then mm. I could have a certain <laughs> amount of influence. Uh, now, it didn't work out exactly like that, but at the same time, that was my feeling at understand, the time. You understand. see, you know, when you're very young, you've got to make a big decision. Are you God or is there another one? And if you're not, well, then you better find out who is and try and uh, mm -hmm. make as much effort as possible to help them out. We're talking to Benedictine monk, Mark Hederman. Fascinating discussion. Mm -hmm. So I reckon a lot of people looking today at our Melbourne Catholic website mm. and enjoying your story would love to hear, I don't know, 60 to 90 seconds about the life of a monk. What happens there in Glenstall Abbey on a daily, weekly, monthly basis? Well, first of all, it's the most beautiful place you could be because it was originally a landlord who was British at the time who constructed this castle because he actually came with Oliver Cromwell, which wasn't a wow. great advertisement in Ireland at the time. Going but back he away, wanted though. to actually yeah. uh, pretend that he came with the Normans, which was in 1066. So he built a Norman castle looking like as if it was built in the 12th century yes. in 1830. Right. A magnificent looking place. And then he went to America in a boat with a friend of his who was called Douglas, after whom the Douglas fir is called. Mm -hmm. And they brought a boatload of trees and shrubs from America. And it's all over. We have the largest um, sequoia tree this side of the, that side of the Atlantic. Right. So it's a paradise. Now, the difficulty was that he uh, was targeted by the IRA, you see, 
uh, not himself, but his daughter wanted to drive a motor car, and the parents said that under no circumstances would a lady of her standing drive a motor car. If she wanted to know how to get into and out of a motor car, she could go to special classes in the finishing school in Paris. <laughs> but actually driving one was not. So she was getting secret lessons as to how to drive from a major in the British Army who was in Tipperary. Tipperary was where the British soldiers were. Yes. And it's a long way. Tipperary is a British soldier song. It's not actually an Irish song. So he was allowing her to drive his car and she was wearing all the equipment which were goggles and and the IRA ambushed the car because they thought he was driving it. Ah. So she was shot thinking that uh, he was the one driving. Yes. They then knew he was in the car so he shot two of them and then they shot him. So the family were devastated and they left the country and they offered the estate to the Irish government at the time but they said no it's too far from Dublin and it's too expensive to run. So it was left fallow and that's how it was offered to the Benedictines in Belgium because the uh, abbot of that community was an Irishman called Columba Marmion. Oh, okay. And yeah. so that was why the Benedictines got the place. So it's not a religious house. It's, it's a fascinating story. Yes. And we are so privileged to live there. There's primeval oaks uh, as you enter. Look, it sounds place. magnificent. It is magnificent. And then the monks who live there, there are 40 of them. Yes. And they're all as odd as myself. <laughs> and so it's... Uh, Tell me about a typical day. Typical day, you get up at six in the morning, and that's regarded as absolutely useless by real monks, you see, who get up in the middle of the night. We get up at six, mm -hmm. then we have morning office for an hour, then we have breakfast, then we work, and then we have lunch. Before that, we have mass. And then we have six o'clock in the evening, vespers in Latin. We mm -hmm. all sing, it's a big place for music. And then we have supper, and then we have Compline, uh, sung again in Latin, and we go to bed. Now, we go to bed, but uh, other people, we have work to do. You know, we run a school, we've got a farm with 200 cattle on it. We have workshops, and people give retreats. There's a shop. So if there's any amount of activity, and so that's the way the the day goes by, as it were. You I mean you hear that program, and you imagine that you know what people are doing, but that's only the structure, or that's only right. the outline. Yeah. People have very interesting lives that they a have. life you love and cherish very much. So yeah. we are very fortunate to have lived that kind of life. I I have been in 17 different countries around the world, even though we've got a vow of stability, mm -hmm. which says you should never leave the monastery to which you are attached, but that vow becomes a pocket edition when you're traveling to Australia. I see. I see. So, yes. I mean, it's slightly it's, redundant, I think. Well, that it's not what you might call, where no, nobody's really uh, got a fetish about these things. You know, it's not a geographical vow. You're meant to stick with it, you see. I see, and, and I see. So it's not... Uh, as if we were in any way restricted. Now, Mark, you've written a swag of books. Yes, I'm kind of addicted to writing. Can I, yeah. can I just pick up on two of them? Because we, yeah. we haven't got enough time to explore them all. Mm. One that took my interest was Underground Cathedrals. Yeah. Can you just tell us a little bit about what the thesis of that book is? Yeah, when the millennium came in Ireland, uh, there was a big spire that was put up in Dublin and people, of course, in Ireland are always complaining about everything. So there was so much complaint about this. There was a huge big spire in the middle of Dublin. It was, um, and people said it was a spike to tell everybody that uh, this was the druggy city of uh, Europe. And that oh, yes. was coming. Yeah. But the architect who put it up, I heard him on the radio, and he said, you've got to imagine that spire as the spire of an underground cathedral that goes all over the country. So that gave me the idea that while the present church, which is in disarray at the mm. moment in Ireland, uh, and Ireland was meant to be the Catholic country that could be an example to the rest of the world, and it was for uh, since 1916 until I suppose 1990 or yes. so, and uh, everybody w believed that that was a very good thing, but now they discovered that there were all kinds of... Uh, uh, reasons why it wasn't a good thing. It so turned out to be a bit of a mess. Oh, yeah. yeah, and in the meantime, there was an underground cathedral which the Holy Spirit was building with a number of other people who were mystics and 
prophets and artists and touch. So it's allowing that cathedral to emerge mm -hmm. in the rubble of the old one. That's everybody's job. You know, nothing is tragic as far as God is concerned. Uh, you just look to see where is the new growth coming. Yes. So that was the idea of underground cathedrals. And what about uh, another book, uh, if you like, it was described to me as a type of modern spirituality, Dancing yeah. with Dinosaurs. Yes. Well, Again, where are you going with that? But dancing with Dinosaurs meant that every business, every organisation on the world... Uh, America does all the statistics here. They last 75% of them for five years and are gone. The 50% of the rest are gone within 10 years. So how does a business or an organization last for 2,000 years? Mm -hmm. The reason is it becomes a multinational corporation, a dinosaur, and it has to if it's going to survive. That's what happened to the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. 1.2 billion people, and it has to be a monster. So what you've got to do is recognize that it wouldn't have survived if it didn't become that kind of multinational corporation, but you've got to learn how to dance with a dinosaur. You can't uh, actually allow it to crush your toes or kneecap you while you, you're dancing. Do you proffer the thought that it needs to change with the times in that same thinking? The Catholic Church requires 200 years for any change, according to the experts. I see. So I would say they have 10 years now, or uh, maybe even five, that they better change quickly or Problems. they become uh, a minority who are irrelevant. Just like, for instance, there's a community of people in America, the Amish community, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they live in the 17th century. They never want to leave the 17th And they're perfectly entitled to do that. They wear the clothes in the 17th century. They use horses and plows. They never... Yes, see, yes. That's what the Catholic Church, because it refuses to leave the 19th century and certainly won't move into the 21st. And unless it does, very quickly, it's going to become an irrelevant minority. Well said, and I'm sure plenty of people watching uh, this mm. will entirely agree with you. Mm. Two more things. One, you have some strong views on education, education in the 21st century. Um, I tend to agree, I think, with a lot of what you say. What are we doing wrong? There's a conspiracy throughout the world to try and harness all the children every single one of them to the economic growth of the world so even in europe now we have uh, we're going to educate everybody from four years of age and we are going to become the most economically competitive con uh, set of countries competing with japan and competing with australia competing with whoever mm -hmm. and china for instance so in other words the children are used as puppets on this board and all the subjects which promote economic growth are favoured, mathematics, science, which are very good. I mean, mm. well, everybody agrees they were wonderful, but uh, the wiped, arts is lost. wiped off the desktop mm. is imagination. Yes. And the arts are gone, and religious education just don't, don't annoy us with irrelevancies. So that's why I'm saying that it is vitally important that we place the child and the human person at the center of our educational systems and recognize that the future is in their hands, that we're not the ones. I mean, we're training people because there are jobs that are being offered by multinationals, which may be obsolete and be done by a robot in two years time yes and those children should have been harvesting different kinds of uh, benefits for themselves and the creativity of each child each child is as uh, unique as our fingerprint and unless we recognize that the business of education is to discover what is that child meant to be? And, and they could be Einstein or they could be somebody who would show us how to live as seven and a half billion people on the planet together. So we have to respect that, listen to the children's voices and then promote their imagination. Rather than modelling them 
to a certain economic end point. And or even trying to pretend to them that the world they're going to live in is going to be the same as the one we're living in today and giving them a whole lot of skills which will be irrelevant. They may be living on the moon for all we know or Mars. There are people who are on a plan. There's one man from Ireland who's planning to go to Mars. It'll take three years to get there and you never come back. There's only one way. He hasn't <laughs> told his family apparently that he's going but anyway that's where they might be. So training them to live on Sunnydale Farm here as we live it is just like as if you were training them how to use a bow and arrow in nuclear warfare. Redundant. Yeah. yeah. One last question, Mark, if I may. Uh, let's finish on, on a, a really positive, optimistic note. What gives you hope right well, now in a difficult world? Well, what gives me hope is that the Holy Spirit is uh, next... Pentecost, which is in very short time, every single person has the opportunity to connect with the Holy Spirit, who is actually directing this universe with our help. Now, we're about as much used to him as a hole in the head, but <laughs> it's a cooperative venture. So I am certain that I've, I've actually traveled the world for three years at the beginning of the century to find out where the Holy Spirit is working. And I'm convinced that there are enough places where the Holy Spirit, enough good people working with the Holy Spirit to give me hope that we're all going in the right direction. Beautifully said and lovely to meet you. Thank you very much. And enjoy you. the rest of Thank your trip you. I will. to our beautiful country. I will. Thank Mark Hedeman. Benedictine Monk, what a pleasure.